he will probably go through all of these things, but uh, let me briefly introduce him. Um, in 1985, he went to uh, West Bank and Gaza Strip, and he worked on the research on, well, their well, Palestinian workers. And then in 1991, he became a senior researcher for a PBS documentary on human rights situation in um, the Gaza Strip and West Bank. And also, um, he became, 1995, he became an Am Amnesty International USA's country specialist for um, Israel and, well, Palestinian authorities. Um, also, uh, he's running a filmmaking company in North Carolina. And actually, um, the films he um, created got a lot of, well, um, hours at the famous uh, film festivals. So we can share his um, view from the researcher's view and also um, the business people's view. So um, please welcome Mr. Rosenbluth. I'm, I'm going to just sit here, um, um, if that's OK, um, with folks. Um, I did want to say before I, I forget and before we get too deep into the um, uh, the subject matter at hand is that um, I do have some materials with me um, on different ways that um, law students can get involved um, in Amnesty. Um, Amnesty has a legal uh, support um, network, which is a really good place for uh, law students to get like practical experience um, in dealing with um, both domestic human rights violations and also um, international law. So if folks are interested, um, they can either grab one of these or um, um, we can talk more. Um, we can talk more afterwards. Or also, two people can ask questions um, if they want. Um, and I'd also be happy if um, um, people want me to to talk more about what um, a country specialist does. Um, I'm Amnesty's country specialist for Israel, um, the occupied territories, and the Palestinian Authority. But we also have our Egypt um, country specialist with us today too. He works at Duke, um, so you can talk with him as well. Um, I know I always promise that I'm going to try to be brief, but um, whenever you talk about Israel and the occupied territories, I mean, it's, it's really much more of a, a semester-long course or a, a senior-level um, law seminar, but um, I'll try to do what I can. Um, the topic I was asked to speak about are um, what are the prospects um, for peace following the Palestinian, um, recent Palestinian elections. Um, and I should also, you know, probably add to that um, how the changes um, in the government in Israel will also be, uh, will also affect the peace process. Um, and I try to answer the question not just um, because I'm here um, speaking in my amnesty capacity, um, but I really do think that that's the framework that it needs to be looked at, um, and that's the human rights framework. Um, I think that by looking at it through this framework, not only is it more clear where the challenges and obstacles are, um, but also where the solutions lie. Um, recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. Anybody know where that comes from? Anybody? <clears throat> That's the first sentence of the preamble of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and it was also the first sentence of a report written by Amnesty, um, not during the recent Intifada, not during the recent uprising, but in 1998, about two years um, before the uprising began. Um, it was a report on five years of um, human rights violations following the signing of the Oslo Peace Accords. Um, and the report described um, Amnesty's human rights concerns um, in Israel and the occupied territories um, since the signing of the Oslo Accords. And it focused on the areas um, that were of main concern to us. Um, and these included violations committed both by the Israeli government and by the Palestinian Authority, um, including arbitrary arrest and detention, um, detention without trial, uh, torture and deaths in custody, unfair trials, possible extrajudicial executions, and unlawful killings. Um, it mentioned, but not, did not detail, other human rights violations, um, such as closures, roadblocks, and curfews, which prevented freedom of movement, confiscation of land, destruction of houses, and other violations. 
what we looked at in this report was that in the five years since the signing of the Oslo Accords, um, the number of Israeli civilians who were killed by armed Palestinian groups who opposed the peace process um, had increased dramatically. Um, these groups, including Hamas and the Islamic Jihad, um, had launched arms attacks, including suicide bombings, usually claiming that they were done uh, in reprisal for attacks by Israelis on Palestinian civilians. Um, but more than 100 Israeli civilians were killed um, in the five years um, after the um, Oslo Peace Accords was signed. In the same period, over 250 Palestinians were killed by Israeli security forces. Um, the vast majority were according to our documentation and research, and also according to the um, documentation and research of other human rights organizations, um, carried out in contravention of international standards on the use of force. Um, and I want to talk um, a lot more about that later. Um, in addition, there continue to be almost a total impunity for these unlawful killings, um, where there were no, um, in effect, no investigations by the Israelis into the killing of um, Palestinian civilians. Um, and as the um, introduction uh, made clear, um, I spent seven and a half years living um, in the West Bank before and during the first um, Palestinian uprising where I was working as a human rights researcher. And a lot of the patterns that we see now, a lot of the patterns that we saw in the Oslo years are the same patterns that have repeated themselves um, for many, many years now. Um, during the Oslo period, during the years after the Oslo Peace Accords were signed, the occupied territories had become um, a land of barriers that with the signing of the um, Oslo Peace Accords and the um, attacks by Palestinians um, on Israelis, gradually more and more the West Bank became um, divided by a series of roadblocks and um, checkpoints. Um, Palestinians were routinely denied passage from one part of the West Bank to another. And again, this is something I want to come back to later, but the roadblocks and the checkpoints that were established in the Oslo years did not separate the West Bank from Israel. What they did is they separated parts of the West Bank from other parts of the West Bank. And that was one of the major um, points of friction for a lot of um, Palestinians. When I went there to visit um, shortly before the recent uprising began, um, that was the complaint you heard again and again from Palestinians is that since the peace process began, that Palestinians' ability to travel freely, Palestinians' freedom of movement was getting um, worse and worse um, rather than better. And at the time, um, Amnesty called on um, all governments that had relations with the Palestinian Authority or with the Israeli government to take all steps necessary to ensure that along with the peace process, that basic human rights were um, guaranteed. Um, in particular, obviously, the uh, justifiable demands that the perpetrators of violent acts against civilians um, be brought to um, justice. Um, our fear was, and our um, uh, motivation for releasing the report was that unless all parties to the conflict were guaranteed basic human rights, that support for the peace process amongst Palestinians on the ground and Israelis on the ground would um, steadily um, erode. Um, and while I don't want to get into a long discussion, long analysis of exactly you know, why the Palestinian uprising happened, um, clearly the human rights violations during the Oslo period gave it fertile ground. And also, too, the attacks by armed Palestinian groups on Israeli civilians very much shaped the Israeli government, the Israeli military's response um, to the uprising when it began. Also in 1998, the same year um, as we released our report, the International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, everyone familiar with what they do? Do people want more detail? People pretty much know? I mean, they're the main um, arbiters. I mean, they're the main um, holders, essentially, of um, international humanitarian law, the laws of war. 
Um, they're considered to be the, um, the body in, in which the four, the four Geneva Conventions rest. Um, and they did a survey of um, 17 countries where either there was a current armed conflict or whether uh, where an armed conflict had recently um, ended. And one of the sites that they studied was Israel and the occupied territories. Um, and they determined that in Israel and occupied territories, um, their findings were by far the bleakest. Um, and I'll just quote briefly uh, from their report. The Red Cross wrote that perhaps as no other place in the world, the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, as well as the Arab states, has engaged entire societies and left the distinction between combatants and civilians in tatters. The consequences are evident in the depth of mobilization in both societies, the scale of disruption and injury, the permissive attitude towards the treatment of prisoners, and in the heightened willingness of all parties to put civilians at risk. The principle of separation between combatants and civilians during wartime has all but been demolished by 50 years of total engagement in conflict. More so than in any other country studied by the RCRC, Israelis and Palestinians countenance attacks on civilians during wartime. And what the Red Cross found is that one of the key factors um, in the erosion of constraints by both Israelis and Palestinians was the perception that the other side did not respect limits. That people on both sides took the fact that the other side broke the rules as permission for their side to do the same. Um, Palestinians and Israelis, therefore, are not just trapped simply in a cycle of violence, but in a cycle of um, justification and a cycle of rhetoric. Um, and the lessons of the Red Cross's study is one that Amnesty has drawn from our work not only in this region, but in other conflicts as well. And that's that the cycle of violence can be contained and eventually broken only if all parties put respect for human rights at the center of efforts to achieve um, peace. Since the recent uprising began, um, over 2,700 Palestinians have been killed by Israeli security forces in the occupied territories. Um, most of these, um, according to our documentation, have been civilian, and over 560 have been children. Um, at the same time, over 1,000 Israelis have been killed by Palestinians. Um, most of these are also civilian, and well over um, 100 of these, oh, thank you, have been children. And um, I mean, it's difficult to pick cases because there have been so many on both sides, so I'll just give you the most um, recent, um, the most recent ones, but the most recent casualties include a three-year-old Palestinian girl who was killed by Israeli forces in the center of the Gaza Strip um, two days ago, the mayor of a northwest, um, the West Bank village of Atouf, who was killed um, by an explosion um, while grazing his cattle um, in an area where the Israeli military had recently conducted live fire exercises, and a 17-year-old Israeli woman in the town of Sederot near the Gaza Strip who died um, while trying to shield her brother um, from the Qassam um, rockets that are fired from the Gaza Strip. Um, more rockets were also fired um, um, at Israeli targets um, in Gaza, near Gaza this week, um, but fortunately no one was injured in those attacks. Um, one of the things that makes this conflict um, so difficult to resolve um, is that both sides see themselves as David in the Battle of David and Goliath. Um, that's not Amnesty's official position, so don't go looking for it um, on our website. Um, but I reached this conclusion in the process of responding to um, the letters and emails um, that we get um, criticizing um, Amnesty's position. And we get these letters and emails both from people who are pro-Israeli um, and from people who are pro-Palestinian. Um, I often um, say that my position within Amnesty should officially be Minister of Hate Mail. Um, because we get so much um, criticism of our work um, from, both, um, from both sides. But the arguments that both sides make are really a distorted um, mirror image um, of each other. Um, 
Both sides base their arguments based on the justness of their cause. Um, both sides base their arguments based on the legitimacy of their fears. Um, and both sides base their arguments on the wrongs um, that are committed by the um, other, other side. Um, many Israelis and their supporters um, believe, and I, I don't question you know, the sincerity of their belief, that they are David in the battle of David and Goliath because they're surrounded by powerful um, and hostile enemies. Um, they see themselves as under daily attack by terrorists. They feel isolated diplomatically in the international community. Um, and they see that um, as the only place where um, Jews can feel safe in the world, that they, if they're not vigilant, they'll be pushed um, into the sea. Um, and they see theirs as a daily struggle for survival. Um, at the same time, um, many Palestinians and their supporters, and I don't question the sincerity of their belief, see themselves as David in the battle of David and Goliath. Um, they see themselves as up against one of the most powerful militaries in the world, backed uncritically by the strongest military um, in the world. Um, they live in daily fear of violence from Israeli soldiers and settlers, um, who they see as killing Palestinians with impunity. Um, they see the ongoing confiscation of their land and the ever-growing um, and expanding settlements um, in the West Bank, as well as the roadblocks um, and the new wall um, being built by the Israelis as isolating them into smaller and smaller enclaves. Um, and they see the support that they get diplomatically from the international community as mostly being um, empty words um, and opportunistic. Um, and they see theirs as a daily struggle for, their su for survival. Um, the sad thing is, is that when I first presented this argument, um, I presented it, I was doing a speaking tour in Seattle, and I was speaking in um, mosques and synagogues and churches, and also on a couple of college um, campuses. Um, and when I presented it in the um, Jewish community and the Arab community, um, both sides laughed. Um, they, they so could not believe that the other side paralleled their fears that they thought it was funny. Now, I'm sure it wasn't, you know, ha-ha funny. I'm sure it was like nervous funny. But both audiences, there was laughter when I presented that um, argument. Um, Israel justifies most of its actions um, on the basis of it being necessary for um, security. And the Palestinians argue that the attacks um, on Israeli civilians are justified um, by their struggle um, for liberation. Um, but if you look at the actions of both sides, um, international law and humanitarian, international humanitarian law in particular, um, it becomes an important framework. Um, in the words of the Red Cross, the most, who's, again, is the most authoritative um, interpreter of international humanitarian law, Whenever armed force is used, the choice of means and methods is not unlimited. Um, international humanitarian law um, sets out standards for humane conduct, which is applicable both to states and to armed groups. In other words, you know, international law doesn't say to governments that you can't defend your citizens. International law doesn't say to um, to, to groups like the to people like the Palestinians, you don't have the right to resist. What it says is that you have to follow um, international law um, in doing so. And one of the most key elements um, of international humanitarian law when it comes to armed conflict is that you have to distinguish between civilian populations and combatants um, at all times. Um, this is commonly called the principle of distinction. Um, and it's codified in all four of the um, Geneva Conventions of 1949, as well as in the additional protocols of 1977. The principle of distinction is um, actually considered to be customary international law. So regardless of whether or not your country is a signatory or in the case of armed groups who are not a signatory, even though you're not a signatory to these conventions, because it's customary international law, um, you're obligated to um, observe it. And this is true whether uh, a conflict is international or non-international. Um, um, now, several times when I've been speaking on behalf of Amnesty, um, mostly on college campuses, um, someone always gets up and quotes um, 
um, the UN resolutions that guarantee the, um, the rights of populations living under occupation to resist. Um, UN Resolution 4429, for example, says that it's the inalienable right of self-determination and independence of all people under colonial and racist regimes and other forms of alien domination and foreign occupation and upholds the legitimacy of their struggle, in particular of a struggle of national liberation movements. Um, and I've even had people quote the um, third sentence of the preamble of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which says, it's essential that if man is not compelled to have recourse to, as a last resort, rebellion against tyranny and oppression, that human rights be guaranteed. And they've tried to say, well, you know, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says that if people are living under tyranny and oppression, that they have the right to resist. Um, and they also imply this means by any means necessary. Um, and we don't dispute the right of Palestinians to struggle against the occupation the same way that we don't dispute the right of the Israelis to defend themselves. Um, Amnesty is not a, a pacifist um, organization, although that, Jeffrey's laughing, um, um, that may in fact change. I mean, there's active discussions now, not just within Amnesty, but within the human rights community as a whole, as to whether or not um, war itself is a human rights violation. And there are active discussions within Amnesty as to whether or not to change this position, but at current, we're not um, uh, a pacifist group. Um, but international re law requires that force be used in accordance with certain basic um, principles. Um, I recently spoke at the Palestine Solidarity Movement Conference when it was held here um, at Duke. I went on Amnesty's behalf to argue with the PSM you know, against their position that they shouldn't um, criticize the strategies um, and tactics of the Palestinians in their struggle for liberation. Um, and I didn't make a political argument against it, but I argued that their position, in fact, contravened international law. Um, that international law obligates them to hold the Palestinians accountable to the same standards um, that they demand from the um, Israelis. And I focused very heavily um, on the fourth Geneva Convention in making my argument. The um, fourth Geneva Convention is very central to the um, struggle of Palestinians on the ground, as well as to um, solidarity activists um, in the United States. And um, basically what I said was a, a very e extended version of um, you can't pick and choose um, which articles of the Geneva Convention you want to follow and which articles of the Geneva Convention you don't want to follow. I mean, you can't say, for example, that the settlements are illegal under, I think it's Article 39 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, and that you know, house demolitions are illegal under this article, and you know, other violations are illegal under that article, and say, well, you know, Article 3, which prohibits attacks on civilians, I don't want to follow that part. International law requires um, that you be um, consistent. You can't pick and choose which parts you like and which parts um, you don't like. Um, Amnesty believes that attacks against civilians by Palestinian armed groups are widespread, systematic, and in pursuit of an explicit policy to attack civilians. Um, therefore, under international law, um, they would constitute um, crimes against humanity. Um, and we've said that um, consistently. Um, and if Palestinians and their supporters don't want to take you know, Amnesty's analysis, um, the Red Cross, which again is the arbiter of the Fourth Geneva Convention, said that Palestinian armed groups operating within or outside the occupied territories are also bound by the principles of international humanitarian law. Thus, in discriminate attacks, such as bomb attacks by Palestinian individuals or armed groups against Israeli civilians, and acts intended to spread terror among the civilian population are absolutely and unconditionally prohibited. Um, and there's even more detail, and again, if people want to get into it, I'd be happy to um, during the questions and answers, but if you look at Protocol 1 of the um, Geneva Conventions, which um, a lot of people feel gives even more rights to, um, to armed groups, actually it provides more um, restrictions. It's much more explicit um, in what's prohibited and what's permitted um, in armed struggle. And even though um, I know this is a law school, there's a limit to how many conventions I can probably quote in detail. Um, 
without people getting really bored. Um, but at the same time, um, Israel also has obligations um, to respect and protect um, human rights. Israel's right to protect its citizens is also not um, unlimited. Um, in addition to prohibiting direct attacks on civilians, um, international human humanitarian law prohibits indiscriminate attacks, um, including attacks which strike military objectives and civilians without distinction. Um, that's very important to keep in mind. Um, as well as attacks directed at a military target, but which causes disproportionate um, injuries to civilians or disproportionate damage to um, civilian property. Um, and again, this is probably a good, a good uh, um, basis for a, a, a semester-long um, seminar, but the whole concept of collateral damage you know, in many cases can be construed itself as a violation um, of international law. And the parallels that are made by groups like the um, PSM and those who defend Israeli policies um, is pretty startling. The um, head of the Raleigh Jewish um, Federation in writing an op-ed um, in the NNO criticizing Duke for holding the Palestine Solidarity Movement Conference said that sadly Israel's actions in response to this violence are necessary and appropriate. Israel regrets having to take these actions to defend its citizenry, but faced with the daily risk of terrorist attacks, it is forced to act. Um, Amnesty's documentation, however, as well as the documentation of every credible um, human rights organization, whether it be Israeli, Palestinian, or international, um, has shown that Israel has consistently used excessive lethal force against Palestinians, um, regardless of whether or not the lives of the soldiers involved in these incidents was in danger. Um, and again, this ph phenomena did not um, start with the beginning of this, um, this uprising. Um, I remember very vividly um, reading comments um, in the media, interviews with um, Israeli officers who were questioned by journalists about the level of force that Israel was using to put down the uprising. And they said, well, you know, this isn't like the last, you know, uprising. You know, this time the Palestinians are armed, they're shooting at, um, back at us, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, you know, my response to that was, well, what does that mean about the over 1,000 Palestinians who were killed during the last uprising? You know, if they weren't armed, what was the um, justification for the use of lethal force in that situation? Um, and again, the excessive use of force by the Israelis has escalated as the Palestinians in turn have escalated their tactics. But there's a consistent pattern of the um, disproportionate use of force, whether it was opening fire with live ammunition at demonstrations in the beginning of the uprising to the um, shelling of villages and towns and cities in the middle phase of the uprising to the use of um, things like helicopter fired missiles to carry out um, extrajudicial executions. All of these measures have led to the disproportionate um, death and injury to um, civilians. Um, and again, I'd be happy to take questions about the specifics, but to go into a detailed analysis of each of these measures um, would require um, more time than we have. Um, so again, while we've never questioned Israel's right to defend its citizens, in fact, we've, we've said clearly the opposite. We've said that Israel not has, only has the right, but in fact has the responsibility to protect its citizens. Um, if you fire a missile from a helicopter to target one Palestinian when the car is um, in traffic in a, in, a, in a densely populated area, you know that civilian casualties are not incidental, but inevitable. Um, if you um, open fire you know, with um, heavy weaponry in response to one sniper who's shooting at you from a densely populated area, you know that civilian casualties are not um, incidental, they're um, inevitable. If you drop um, a bomb from a plane you know, on an apartment block to assassinate one individual, you know that civilian casualties are not incidental, they're inevitable. Um, so um, under international law, you know, these actions are a clear, um, are a clear violation. Um, Amnesty has called on armed Palestinian groups not to fire um, on Israeli soldiers from populated areas. 
Um, but that does not remove the responsibility of the Israeli military um, to refrain from the use of indiscriminate force. Um, now, I'm trying to think, probably cut my remarks short because I want to leave time for questions and answers, but um, there's a new um, Israeli human rights group, which we've just heard about very recently, um, called um, um, Breaking the Silence. And what they're doing is very interesting. These are all either reservists or active duty um, Israeli soldiers. Um, and what they're doing is going out and interviewing their fellow reservists and their fellow soldiers to gather um, detailed documentation about violations that are committed by the military. Um, because effectively, there's no um, investigations into the killing of civilians by the um, Israeli government. And again, this is a recurrent, uh, recurrent pattern. Um, the, um, one of the more interesting cases um, dealing with the lack of investigations was in October of 2001, where um, a Palestinian um, boy of around age 11 um, was killed by the military, and two of his friends were wounded. And the Israelis claimed that there was a riot, and there were percussion grenades, and there were armed people opening fire, despite the fact that all the eyewitnesses said that there was nothing going on at the time, and amnesty obtained several um, affidavits, as well as the Israeli group um, B'Tselem, um, which is an excellent um, Israeli human rights organization. And B'Tselem like, sent a letter of inquiry to the Israelis saying, you know, can you give us the details of this case? And they sent them a letter saying, we investigated, and there doesn't seem to be any reason to investigate it further, and you know, standard operating procedure was, fi was followed. However, the um, clerk who was sending um, B'Tselem, the um, official response from the military, um, either accidentally or otherwise, um, inserted a copy of the official file. <laughs> Whoops. Um, and what the official file said was exactly the opposite. What the official file said was basically substantiated what the Palestinian eyewitnesses were saying. Nevertheless, none of those soldiers were ever held um, accountable for the killing of this um, child, and if it wasn't for the fact that the file was accidentally attached, not only would the truth not have come out, but the, the flaws in the Israeli investigation system also would not have um, come out. Um, so basically, there's two dynamics, that the opening fire regulations and the official policies that the Israeli government uses governing the use of force are excessive. And in addition to this, even when those rules are violated, there's no um, investigations um, whatsoever. And when I spoke at the PSM conference, um, a student um, came up to me. I don't know if he's a Duke student or not. Um, and said you know, he really you know, disagreed with my analysis that there was um, a similarity between the excessive use of force by um, Israel and the deliberate targeting of civilians by the Palestinians. So I asked him a question. I said, you know, hypothetical situation. You know, what if, you know, a Palestinian sniper was holed up in an Israeli hotel, a skyscraper, where it was impossible to determine which window he was firing from? Would the Israeli military respond with massive force and risk killing Israeli civilians and tourists in order to, um, to stop him? Um, and I think in some ways that goes to the, um, the crux of the matter is that the military knows that if there are civilian casualties, that those civilian casualties would be Palestinian. Um, and there's no um, restraint um, um, either by the government or by the individual soldiers themselves. Um, but leaving legalism um, and international law aside, um, and I, I promise to get to my conclusion as quickly as I can, but. Um, Whatever distinctions you want to draw between a deliberate attack and you know, excessive force and whatever justification you put on it, um, the effect on the communities and the effects on the families are the same. Um, you can't tell the parents of Shalevet uh, Pass, who was a 10-month-old um, Israeli um, girl who was actually killed um, while her father was um, holding her in his arms in front of their um, home in a settlement in the city of Hebron, that she's a, a military target and, and shooting her is acceptable. Um, and you also can't tell the, um, the parents of Ashraf Khader, who is an 11-year-old Palestinian boy who was killed. Um, the Israelis were uh, targeted with missiles 
uh, an apartment building in Nablus, and he was killed by the um, debris. He was playing with his brother um, out front. You can tell his family that, well, you know, he's just collateral damage, or this was a legitimate military target. Um, these killings undermine um, people's feeling of safety, um, and they also undermine um, uh, the, the peace process, because unless both Palestinians and Israelis feel safe, um, peace is going to be um, impossible. Um, so the first step towards peace is obvious. Um, both sides have to take all steps, all measures possible to stop the um, violence. Um, and one thing that I did not really go into detail, but even though these attacks are being carried out by the Palestinian armed groups, the Palestinian Authority um, is responsible in many ways for failing to take measures to stop them. Um, and so while the PA you know, clearly needs to take measures to stop these armed groups, so too does the Israeli government have to take measures to change the opening fire regulations and to discipline those soldiers um, who violated them. In fact, today's op-ed um, in the Israeli newspaper um, Haaretz um, is um, simply entitled Stop Shooting um, and basically makes that same point that unless the violence stops, um, peace is not going to be possible. And they highlighted the case I was talking about earlier of this, um, this girl who was killed in Gaza this week. And what happened in that case was that there were missiles um, fired from um, Deir Bella, which is a Palestinian town in the Gaza Strip. And after the missile was fired, the soldiers opened fire with live ammunition um, and fired into um, Deir Bella. Well, you know, it's extremely unlikely that that had any you know, recognizable military objective. Um, it certainly wasn't going to stop the missile from being fired. And the risk of civilian casualties was extremely high. Um, and Haaretz pointed that out as you know, a good example of a type of violence that's only going to up undermine the, um, the peace process. Um, six months into the uprising, um, Amnesty um, released a document called the Human Rights Agenda for Peace. Um, and you can actually download it from our website um, just by typing in you know, Human Rights Agenda. And it's actually interesting because you can also see similar documents we wrote for um, Afghanistan and Venezuela and South Korea um, and other um, conflicts. Um, but the document stated that unless basic human rights for all parties to the conflict were guaranteed, um, that peace would be um, impossible. And the, the challenge we face in trying to move this agenda forward, I think, is illustrated um, by how it was received amongst Israelis and Palestinians. Um, I, I was fortunate to represent the U.S. section of Amnesty, um, accompanying the, the delegation from the International Secretariat in London. I mean, Amnesty is an international organization, but the main center is in London. And both the Israeli section and the Palestinian section of Amnesty absolutely hated the document um, because it held both sides to the same standards and said to both sides, look, you both need to um, follow the same rules. The, Several of the Israeli members said that, you know, if you showed this to any Israeli school kid, you know, they would swear that it was written by Yasser Arafat himself. And a lot of the um, Palestinians we spoke to said, oh, if you show this to any Palestinian school kid, you know, they'll swear it was written by the Israeli um, intelligence services. Um, but after discussion and dialogue with them, and after we sat and talked about it, um, I think we persuaded them um, that it really is the only way forward. Um, and that brings us to what's our role here um, in the United States. Um, and, you know, again, this is a message that we put out consistently, that um, unless we can get um, pressure on both the Israelis and the Palestinians to um, follow um, international law, um, the peace process is not going to work. Um, and that pressure, particularly from the United States, which is such a... Um, a powerful influence um, in the region, um, I, I think, is very um, important. Um, simply put, rather than arguing endlessly about who is right and who is wrong and who did who, uh, who did what to who, that um, governments have to begin to hold both sides um, accountable. Um, and in that light, and I know I talked a lot um, about the um, about the violence itself, but there are other. Um, human rights elements that are extremely um, important. And you would think that in this period, that in addition to stopping the violence, that the Israeli government would bend over um, backwards to avoid taking measures that would undercut 
the newly elected Palestinian government's credibility and ability to show that they can get um, concessions, they can get um, a decent peace agreement from the um, Israelis. But in the past week, there's two um, events that happened, I think, in particular um, that hurt the peace process and also contravene international law. Um, the first is that um, Palestinians from the West Bank who own land in what Israel considers to be um, Jerusalem have had their land um, confiscated under the absentee property law. Now, what happened there is when Israel built the security barrier preventing Palestinians from the West Bank from entering Israel, a lot of Palestinians found that their land was on the wrong side of the barrier. So Israel has now said, well, since they no longer have access to their land, they're absentees and have used that um, as a justification to confiscate their land. Now, not only is that a violation of international law, but it also undercuts the Israelis' claim that the security barrier is there primarily for reasons of security, whereas Palestinians have argued, and in many ways this gives their argument legitimacy, that the way that the fence is being constructed, not directly on the 1967 border, um, was, a, was a, a justification for a land grab by the Israelis. This measure kind of says, well, OK, you know, maybe that's true. The um, other thing that the Israelis have done, which also was announced this week, is saying that Palestinians from East Jerusalem now need permits to enter the West Bank. Now, the reverse has been true for many, many years, and it's been a major source of friction and tension for Palestinians. I mean, East Jerusalem has always been the economic and social and academic and cultural center of Palestinian life in the West Bank. So for many years now, Palestinians from the occupied territories could not enter Jerusalem. Now the reverse has happened. Israel issued an order this week saying Palestinians from East Jerusalem cannot go to the West Bank without a, uh, a permit. Um, effectively, um, if the permit process that's going to be used in this case is the same as the permit process that has been used in the past, these permits are going to be virtually impossible for people to get. The bureaucratic obstacles that are put in people's way um, will make them virtually impossible um, to get. Um, there are literally thousands of Palestinians from East Jerusalem who work in Palestinian offices and institutions and other um, places of employment in the occupied territories because these offices that used to be in East Jerusalem had to move to the West Bank because West Bankers couldn't get into Jerusalem to work there. So they relocated to the West Bank. And now East Jerusalemites are not going to be able to um, get there. Um, I'm going to tell one short personal anecdote. And I promise um, um, I'll stop. But when I was living in the um, West Bank, I used to go back and forth a lot from the West Bank to Gaza. And um, I was talking with a taxi driver in my um, now limited, but then probably a little bit less limited, um, um, Arabic. And um, you know, he was asking what I did and you know, why I spoke Arabic and what I was doing. And I said that I was working for you know, a human rights organization, saying, oh, what do you do? And I was describing some of the work we did. And he said, you know, human rights really doesn't matter. You know, he said, you know, the reason, you know, as a Palestinian, that I hate the occupation is that as parents everywhere want for their kids, I can't have a better life for my kids than I had. Um, and I think that's extremely important and extremely significant because um, you know, unless we can guarantee that people have um, a normal life, so to speak, with freedom of movement, freedom to turn a living, and obviously, most importantly, um, not getting killed um, for lack, I can't quite think of the correct human rights term way, way to phrase that. But um, I, I think that the peace process um, um, will not move forward. Um, um, Desmond Tutu um, recently said that in times of war, you have laws of war. You can't say no hold barred because then there is no civili civilization. It's just chaos. Um, everybody for themselves. Um, and I think that those are um, good words to end with. So I'll take people's questions if they have any. Can you take questions? Yes. I'd be happy to take them. Yes, sir. I was just curious. You talked a lot about the uh, the environment that produced it, these human rights violations. Do you see anything in the new leadership that um, is hopeful, or do you think that this is merely an articulation of the fear and anger that exists on both sides? Um, 
I'm cautiously optimistic. I mean, um, there have been um, stronger statements than we've seen in the past um, about the, um, the willingness to um, reign in the armed groups. Um, I think particularly the order, um, you know, barring um, Palestinian civilians from carrying weapons is a step forward. But I, I think it remains to be seen. Um, and again, I mean, it's, it's always difficult because both sides want the other side to move um, first. Um, but I, I think it's going to be a balance. I think it was um, not wise of the uh, Israeli government a few hours after apparently reaching an agreement with the Palestinian Authority to stop targeting um, Palestinian activists who it accuses of being involved in um, attacks on Israelis to uh, assassinate a Hamas official in the West Bank. I mean, it's that type of um, um, provocation by both sides that I think are going to um, be difficult to overcome. And in fact, that was what the op-ed in Haaretz today was saying, is that you know, both sides have to stop shooting at each other. So I, I would say I'm cautiously optimistic. Yes, in the way back. Um, you've talked a lot about the um, kind of the many obstacles that are, are faced here and, and this both sides feeling just by both sides are afraid to take first step or two that they'll be left vulnerable. But uh, I was wondering if you could comment some on, on what I've kind of felt is the other thing that seems to make this an effectual process, which is uh, sort of extremists on both sides who feel that they're, that you know it's God's will for them to take the entire land, yeah. um, which which seems like even if the people who are, are of goodwill but fear the other side could be made to trust the other side, there's, there seems to be these uh, extremists who won't let that happen, who assassinate peaceful leaders like Isaac uh, Rabin. Yeah. So I mean, have you any comments on that? Yeah, you know, and and again, I mean, I think that you know the extremists will always be there. Um, my, my worry and my concern is much more the, the tolerance of the you know, extremists within both societies, both on an official level and an unofficial level. It's really interesting to see now that the um, Israeli government, including um, um, Sharon, are being attacked by the, um, by the settlers. Um, and you know, for years and years and years, I mean, I remember reading documentation going back to the early 80s where you know, um, settlers have attacked Palestinians with virtual you know, impunity. That um, when I was working in the West Bank, we documented cases of not only settlers attacking Palestinians with impunity, but um, Israeli soldiers actually being there physically and watching. Um, I, I have you know, personal experience where um, there was um, settlers who were basically just going running wild in downtown Ramallah and like shooting up the place. And I went out there with a Canadian colleague um, just to try to reason with them. It was a really stupid thing to do. But, um, um, and the, the, right on the corner, watching this whole thing, was you know, an Israeli patrol. And we had you know, the license number of their car. The Israeli soldiers were there watching. And we were unable, despite the intervention of the Canadian embassy and the US embassy, to get any investigation into the case. Um, and this was against, you know, against foreigners, but Palestinians, there isn't even a chance. So for years, the settlers have been able to act with total impunity. Now, where the Israeli government is trying to crack down on them, there's a history of government inaction against the extremists. And the same is true on the Palestinian side. It always will be you know, extremists, but the fact that the Palestinian Authority has failed to act and has failed to crack down on Hamas and Islamic Jihad um, I, I think is much more concerning. If, I think if there is positive movement towards peace, I think the, the extremists on both sides would become more relevant. Yes, sir. Uh, I was interested about uh, the position of Amnesty International uh, on the question of international humanitarian law and the insistence that both sides are bound by it and both sides should observe it. Sure. However, there are some structural problems with international humanitarian law that very much limit its applicability to cases like uh, the situation in the Middle East, but also for what's going on in Iraq. And I see two of them. The first one is that international humanitarian law was designed and evolved in the context of the classic interstate issues like World War I, World War II, where you have the US Army against the Japanese Army, everyone more or less equipped with the same things, uh, and you duking it out on the battlefield. But even during World War II, we saw that whenever we had to deal with non-state actors, like partisan insurgents, guerrillas, 
Then all of a sudden, you know, the boundaries of civility were broken and there was no more like Geneva Convention and everything was going, you know, and people were hanged in the, by street lamps. The inherent problem there is that it's true that on the face of it, the way to de-escalate violence is holding both parties accountable for violations of this and asking them to behave the same way. But the fact is that the, both parties do not have the same means. If you have to fight against an Israeli tank and you don't have another <coughs> tank, what are you going to do? Are you throwing stones to the tank to stop it? Are you taking your handgun? Well, if you try to shoot with your handgun to the tank, you don't do any damage. But if you do take that same handgun against the head of an Israeli policeman around the block, mm -hmm. then you might still do damage to the state of Israel as such. I'm not getting into the question of involving or not involving civilians. So to paraphrase Donald Rumsfeld, uh, when he was asked about uh, the armoring of, you know, of, uh, of uh, military vehicles in the United States that was lacking, and he said, well, you fight the wars with the means you have. Well, that applies also to the in Iraq. You fight the wars with the means you have. You cannot take the first, uh, you know, power, military power in the war on, on the same ground. Not even if you are the Chinese army, you can. Sure. The it's other problem, the other problem with that, and it's the problem of international humanitarian law, is the question of enforcement. Is that who and who holds these parties accountable for violations? You cannot leave the enforcement to Israeli courts or to the Palestinian Authority. You need to have a higher level. Sure. But this higher level is there, it's the United Nations, but it's blocked by internal bickering between the parties that, you know, keep on backing one side against the other. Unless we do not really clear the obstacle there, there's really no perspective for international humanitarian law to make a dent into the problem. Sure. Um, they're both really good questions. Um, the, the answer to the first question, I, I think, is pretty clear, is that, I mean, amnesty's um, dispute with the armed Palestinian groups is not their choice of weapons, but their choice of targets. That, I mean, if, and again, we're not a pacifist organization, so if armed Palestinians want to shoot at Israeli soldiers and they want to shoot back and forth at each other, we don't have a position. But it's clear under international law, even more clear um, under the additional protocols, which really go in in detail, um, you know, a lot more um, about armed conflict. I mean. Some people almost argue that the additional protocols were practically written for the um, Israeli-Palestinian um, conflict because of the detail that it goes into. But um, the, the prohibition against targeting civilians is clear. So the argument that, well, you know, we can't hit hard targets, so we have to hit soft targets in order to engage in struggle, it has no validity under international law. I mean, okay, there's no question that it's, it's easier, you know, to blow yourself up on a bus in Tel Aviv than it is to hit a tank, but civilian targets are, are just clearly off, off limits. Um, and it, it's true, I mean, from a power dynamic you know, point of view. Well, I mean, it, it's also true for, and again, I mean, one of the criticisms that Palestinian groups raise about our reports is that we're always much more you know, explicit in our con condemnation about um, suicide bombings than we are by the Israelis' use of force, because with the Israelis, where we say, always try to hedge it because of the whole problem of being able to investigate. Whereas in the Palestinian cases, they take credit and say, yep, we did it. You know, so uh, it's easier for us to condemn those. But still, the, the power imbalance you know, from an international law perspective doesn't affect the prohibition on, on targeting of, uh, of, of civilians. As opposed to military targets, we don't, uh, we don't take a stand. So I, I do agree with you really about what mm -hmm. Law oh, basically is by being blind mm -hmm. to the imbalance of power on the ground, basically it becomes mm -hmm. a fiction. I mean, it's right. a fiction that basically alienates who? The people right. who should respect it because they don't believe it in it anymore because they right. think it's only a tool for the powerful to keep the oppressed people oppressed. Well, but you know, again, as I said, you know, um, um, earlier on my remarks, you know, both sides really do see themselves as the weaker power. It depends on how you. Um, uh, how you look at it. But the, the answer to your second question as to enforceability, you know, again, I think it comes back to responsibility of people in other countries. In fact, Article 1 of the Geneva Convention says that not only are countries, you know, obligated to observe the, um, these conventions, but they're obligated to ensure their observation. So, you know, the United States and Europe and other countries which are um, higher contracting parties, signatories, to the Geneva Conventions are obligated to ensure that they're respected. 
So um, I mean, that's one reason why the fact that the United States continues to um, economically make the, um, the settlements possible um, in the occupied territories is, is, can be seen as a contravention um, of those conventions. The responsibility for ensuring respect falls back, I think, not on the um, Israelis and Palestinians themselves, but um, outside. One major thing which could go a very long way uh, towards ensuring respect is um, the formation of a human rights monitoring force, um, which Amnesty has consistently called for. And you know, I'm not talking about you know, armed intervention on one hand, and I'm not talking about you know, groups like Amnesty on the other hand. Our role is very different. But a, you know, an official human rights monitoring group that has the, the mandate, in other words, the agreement of the Israelis and the Palestinians, the, um, the equipment, you know, and the training to do their job um, properly. If a human rights monitoring force was properly organized and formulated, it would go a long way towards protecting civilians on both sides. Yes, sir. With both sides recognizing that they need to stop fighting. But it would seem that that's not likely to happen any time in the immediate future, just because it only takes a few people on either side with an assault rifle or a stick of explosives to totally disrupt the process. So that being the case, is there a plan B? Can anything be done short of an absence of total, of total uh, violence? Well, I mean, again, if, you, if you're using international law on the basis, um, the uh, additional protocols to the Geneva Convention specifically prohibit reprisals. So, I mean, if both sides were observing it, that would go a long way. Again, the, the human rights monitoring force would step in. But, I mean, the, stopping the conflict, one of the most essential elephant, ele elephants, good heavens, um, um, elements has to be um, the, stopping attacks on civilians by both sides. Because unless that happens, you know, that is a prerequisite. Unless that happens, both sides will not have um, faith um, in the peace process. So other things have to happen too, and I'm not saying that um, a human rights agenda in and of itself is going to resolve the conflict, but it is uh, an essential prerequisite. I think we can take one more quick question and then we'll have to... Um... Yes, sir. So you were here in front of the conference. Correct. Can you speak to any connection between um, there being a ruckus on Duke's campus and does that help at all? Does it just aggravate the situation? Or is it just sort of irrelevant? Well, I, I have to say that um, I mean, I've spoken on a lot of campuses. Um, and um, I, I have to say, I think Duke really is, um, should be congratulated for um, um, its efforts to try to provide a, an environment for constructive dialogue. On, on too many other campuses, um, most recently at Columbia, um, this week Columbia University canceled uh, uh, a conference on Middle East peace um, because of pressure from pro-Israel um, groups. Um, a, a lot of other campuses um, try to like bury their heads and pretend it's not happening or deal with it in terms of saying if, if there can't be you know healthy dialogue we're not going to have any dialogue at all and I think that um, um, the approach that Duke has um, taken is very healthy. Um, it, it's, it's not an easy topic. It's a very controversial topic. It's a very emotional topic. Um, it's a topic that um, um, people feel very strongly about. So trying to find a way to have constructive dialogue is fairly um, challenging. And I think that the route that a lot of other campuses have had um, of basically trying to censor dialogue or squelch dialogue. And you know, again, it, it's both sides. I mean, at Concordia in Montreal, the um, uh, um, pro-Palestinian groups on campus basically um, um, got Hillel, the Jewish Students Organization, banned from campus. Um, and I think that that type of action is completely counterproductive. Um, but in a lot of ways, I think it reflects what's going on in the region. Can I have to ask you one quick question? Sure. Can we have to leave your... Can you... I have a very fast. Oh, after the class? Sure, I'll stick around. And, you know, again, if people, if anyone's interested um, in Amnesty's um, legal support network, um, I have um, brochures. So. Thank you, Matthew Rosenberg. And I'll, I'll stick around as long as people have questions. So.
What a nice surprise. I wasn't expecting to see you at all. Hi, how are you? Good, good to see you. Hi. It was a great talk. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I was that book for mm -hmm. you, and they said that it wasn't shelved yet. They had it, that it was like in... That's bizarre. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> okay. They're supposed to email me. Okay. About it, so I will let you know. Thanks for trying. Yeah, I'm That's sorry. That's great. <coughs> like, what book? I'm trying to call torture? Or? It's really, really new. I mean, it's yeah, just they out. Was, they said it had just come out, and, and I was like, could I try? And they just said it was like in the process of getting. I had a call number and everything, mm -hmm. but it wasn't shelved. So they were like... It was in limbo. Cool. Hey, Liz, this is April, my LSAT tutor. This is April, my LSAT tutor. Oh, hi. hi. It's so nice to meet you. Oh, well, Marty, Marty was a great, great student. I wish they could all be like Marty. Nice Marty has serious motivation. That's true. That's true. Well, I'm just yes. A little more sure, of course. So, a short question. Yeah.